And here we go. Welcome everybody to The Big Idea. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Hanna. Today we are talking about cervical instability and where it's going to be probably more than just a neck adjustment that's going to help to solve the issues. I've had a few comments come over the week here that are touching people's uh, questions on cervical instability. Here are three of them that are going to be kind of the, the highlight of this particular video. I have cervical instability of C2, C3, and C4. Can the ligaments and tendons heal or tighten on their own over time? Comment number two, guys, upper cervical care can be helpful, but if you have a serious neck issue, you're going to need PRP injections, so protein-rich plasma injections of the facet joints, ligaments and tendons to strengthen the lax tendons and ligaments, which are allowing your discs to, quote, slip. And I'll make a, a brief little comment. This person knows what they're talking about because even though that's a common expression, discs slip, discs do not slip. So this person does understand what's going on here um, and offers some really, really good advice that we're going to hit on here. So continuing on, you can also try prolotherapy, but PRP is a lot more effective. I've been going through hell for seven years with dizziness, equilibrium, brain fog, pain, etc., and is the only treatment that is providing me relief. I hope this helps. And then third comment, hello sir, is it actually possible to re-strengthen the neck ligaments with some form of exercises or do you ultimately need injections? Thank you. So this is what we're going to be getting into this particular video. There is a time and place for all of the different healthcare and medical care options. And guess what? Your success depends on what the true nature of what's going on is. If I was to sit here and say the only thing that you ever need to do is just do these stretches, just do these exercises, just get these adjustments, and that's going to fix everything, that is a lie. With increasing severity, we're going to need increasing amounts of intervention. But in the same breath, I also want to emphasize how all of these things fit together. So let's jump into this video, have a look at how you identify these kinds of issues and what to do with what you find out. Okay, first up, what I need to do is I need to address something I've talked about in a number of different videos when we're talking about different levels of injury. So firstly, ligaments are the things that hold joints in your body together. So they are essentially the glue, but they do not just hold things statically in place. They're designed to have a certain amount of flexibility, a certain amount of movement. The problem is, is if you've got too much movement, then you're dealing with where things are moving too much. This is not going to be good. Oftentimes, at least in my experience, this can happen for one of two reasons. Number one, you've got an injury where things have actually become excessively flexible. But number two, there are other levels of the spine that simply put aren't moving enough. And you've got to figure out what the difference is between those two. We're going to have a look at how we can do some basic diagnostics to tell that difference. But when we're talking about ligament injuries, we're talking about at least two different entities, things that are moving not enough, and then things that are moving too much. Now, in addition to that, levels of moving too much. I've talked about this where you have different levels of injury. You have what's initially known as thinning. So this is where you have micro tearing of the ligaments. So things are still pretty stable, but not quite as strong as they originally were. Then you have tearing, aka a grade two injury. This is where you have a partial disruption. Things are moving too much, but still within the body's capacity to be able to handle it. And then you're dealing with grade three, torn. This is where there is a full thickness tear and now things are really really moving way 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 too much and this is well let me back up there a little bit the grade one and arguably the grade two this is where the conservative approaches are useful upper cervical chiropractic physical therapy massage other forms of rehabilitative therapy these are good for the grade ones and the grade twos but when you are dealing with certain kinds of grade twos and when you're dealing with grade threes this is where the medical intervention, either injections or surgery, is necessary to provide that additional support and stability. Now, to get to that very first question that we had there, can the ligaments and tendons heal on their own over time? 
If we're dealing with grade one and grade two injuries, yes, until you take your last breath, your body never forgets how to heal itself. The caveat is how well can it within limitations of matter. We live on a planet with time, gravity, and stress. We have to address these things. And ligaments, tendons, at best, they heal to 70% of their original capacity. They get filled in with scar tissue. They get filled in with more lax kind of uh, ligaments, what's known as an uh, elastin or a scar tissue fiber, one of the two. And what this means is it means that if you are dealing with a ligament injury, it may never get back to 100% of what it was. Fortunately, brain's not stupid, body's not weak. It's going to find clever ways to adapt for these kinds of issues. Very important then that we're doing the right kinds of exercises, the right kind of stretches, and that the joints of the body, and we're going to be emphasizing on the spine, obviously, because the nature of our conversation here, these things can and do stabilize over a period of time. So I think you can appreciate if you're dealing with just thinning or if you're dealing with small tearing, yes, body's got a lot better opportunity of resolving and adapting to these issues on its own. However, when we're dealing with those big kind of injuries, it's still going to heal, but you might need a little bit more um, in higher level intervention. So if you would, you break a bone. Presuming it's not complicated, okay, what do you do? You're going to have it cast and it's going to heal. Now, it's going to heal on its own whether you have it cast or not. The question is, is it going to heal the right way? versus that's a simple fracture then let's imagine that things are absolutely shattered where you have compromise of nerves of muscles of blood vessels all this this is going to be the time you need a little bit more if not a lot more advanced medical intervention to get things as good as possible then splint it up and keep a really, really close eye on that. So that's ultimately the longest way that I can make that point, that depending on the nature of the injury that you have to those tendons, to those ligaments, there is a certain threshold in terms of what can you expect in terms of your recovery, in terms of improvement conservative or simple kinds of things they can be cons uh, managed conservatively but if it is more severe then you're probably going to need some type of more advanced medical intervention so i just wanted to address that piece first and foremost now the question is how do you tell the difference there's lots of different diagnostics out there you can be doing this with motion cbcts you can do this with a dmx so digital motion x-ray but what I'm going to show you on this particular video right now is one of the most simple and also traditional ways that you can do this. All you need is somebody who's able to do a basic x-ray assessment for your neck. Okay, so what do we have here first? What we have is a lateral or side view of a person's cervical spine or their neck. So we've got head up here, eyes, teeth, mouth. And then we've got the neck going like this. And this is not a happy neck in the, uh, the best, uh, best of circumstances. So number one, we are seeing that there is uh, degenerative arthritis, disc damage, conal, where basically these areas right through here are flattened. Um, the big bit that jumps immediately to me is that the normal curve of the neck, which should be, and let me actually, I'll draw this out here for you, should kind of be, usually helps if we push the right button, should be an arc that kind of looks something like this with uh, that, basically the start point right here, right over the top like this. So you can see that this person's neck is going completely backward, which is going to significantly increase the amount of tension on the muscles, on the ligaments, on the nerves, on the discs, but also on the spinal cord itself, a condition known as a cervical uh, myelopathy or stenosis. So we'll get rid of that here. But what I also want to point out on this person's films here is that if you're looking along the back of each of the vertebra, kind of like this, you see what's known as a stair-stepping deformity in other words these are not forming smooth contiguous lines there is a disruption and this only happens if there is pretty pronounced ligament stretching or damage so the question is 
Is this because something is just locked into the wrong position and it actually needs to move more? Or is it because you have too much movement in these particular areas? Now, what you would do then is you would do a series of tests then to find out what is the difference because one of them is something that can be managed with upper cervical chiropractic. The other one is going to need either physical therapy, which you probably need physical therapy for both to tell you the truth, but is going to involve either physical therapy and or may need injections or even surgical stabilization because it's moving way too much. And there are two ways that can be done to screen for that. So if you all have films of your own, you can kind of go through some of this, uh, these protocols on your own. So let's have a look at screening method number one. And of course, it's going to make a bit of a difference if you know what some of the anatomy is that you're looking for. But this is analysis method number one to see if you are concerned about a potential area of instability that is ligaments moving too much. What you do is you would identify and you draw a line across the bottom base of each of the vertebrae. You can't really do C1. C1 is completely different, but you start at C2 and then you do it at C3, C4, C5, and C6. And then what you simply do is you measure that angle relative to the horizontal plane and joints are supposed to be sitting in different planes. So that in and of itself is not what the issue is. But what you do next is you have a look and you see what is the difference between these individual numbers. Normal is considered to be less than or equal to 11 degrees difference between adjacent levels. If you see 11 degrees or more, that is a suspected sign where you're dealing with an instability issue. So let's do some basic math here. So this one here is going to be the C2 and this one's going to be the C3. 25 minus 19 is 6. So this is well within normal limits. C3 to C4, 19 minus 13 equals 6. Also normal. Now C4 to C5, 13 minus 1, that's 12. 12 is more. So we are suspecting, uh-oh, C4 to C5, this area is potentially unstable. And it doesn't mean that your neck and your head are going to fall off of your shoulders. I'm not talking about instability like that. It's not going to kill cripple unless you're sealing dislocations or infiltrations into the, the spinal canal, N nothing like that. But this area is moving way, way, way too much. And what that means then is all the conservative options you want in the world, they're probably not going to resolve it. This is the time and the place for where you might be needing either injections or a cervical uh, stabilization procedure, surgery. So this is going to take us back to our second comment. Guys, upper cervical care can be helpful, but if you have serious neck issue, you're going to need injections to the facets, the ligaments, and all that sort of stuff because the lax ligaments are allowing the discs to, quote, slip. Again, and they're using the terminology right. And I 100% agree with what this person is saying. There is a time and a place for the different forms of intervention. If you're dealing with things that are not moving enough, yes, adjustments can help. But if it's moving too much, you're going to need a different form of treatment. And I'll talk a little bit more explaining the nature of different injections and a couple of bits of uh, even surgery if that was required. Um, even though it's not my area of expertise, I can at least direct people and I can identify when those kinds of procedures are appropriate. But before I do that, I'm going to jump into the next kind of diagnostic that can be done to see if you are truly doing with a, an instability of the cervical joints. Let's have a look. So what we do now is we go to cervical flexion, so chin down, and then extension, so head back. And as you can see here, this person's overall flexibility is actually extremely pronounced. In and of itself, 
That does not necessarily mean hypermobility. Granted, certain people with genetic conditions such as Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or other connective tissues, as opposed to the ligaments genetically being super strong like this, they are more flexible at the best of times. So this person may have something like that going on, but in and of itself, it's like, okay, we're not seeing it just at a, a quick glance here because as I kind of alluded to before is if you've ever got a joint that is locked up not moving enough an adjacent area will start moving a little bit more. The question is at what point is it moving too much now and to do this you're going to do a few additional measurements let me show you what they are. Now this admittedly takes a little bit more work um, and I've actually made some annotations on these uh, x-rays that I didn't need to do. So you'll see that I still have all of the angles like I showed you on the previous one in both views. Uh, that's not actually going to be part of this particular analysis. What you're going to be doing is you would be looking at these individual levels like this, where what you do is you draw a line along the back of each of the vertebral bodies like this. And you do that in both the flexion and you do it in the extension view. And remember that stair-stepping phenomenon that I talked about where instead of the adjacent vertebra forming like a smooth contiguous line, you're looking to see if there's an offset like this and measuring that up in millimeters. So you can see that in the, the flexion case, what have we measured? 2.2, 2.35, 3.25, 1.64. Now, if you go from full flexion to full extension, here's the number. The maximum, quote unquote, normal amount is 3.5 millimeters. If you add up the total difference between the flexion and the extension, and it is 3.5 millimeters or greater, you're dealing with an area of instability and that is not the place to be making an adjustment. That's where you're going to need something different that's going to help that area which is moving way too much start to actually solidify injections or even surgery, dare I say, if we need to go there. So let me show you a few examples. So 2.2 and 0.75 so we add the two of those together and it's going to be about three i'm doing the math in my head here so do forgive me uh it's going to be uh just under about three millimeters so yeah there's more movement than there should be but it's not to that full threshold the next level 2.35 plus another 0.79 so again this one is just over the three but not quite far enough now here we go, and sure enough, this is the same level that we saw in that neutral film between the C4 and the C5. When they go into a flexion, it is going forward 3.25 millimeters, so it is almost all the way there. But then you add up the other side, 1.83, 5 millimeters. This area between the C4 and the C5 this one is the one that's moving way too much. This is the one and this is the type of individual where either an injections or if they need a surgical stabilization, this is going to be where it becomes very important. There is also, if I'm looking at the C5 and the C6, 1.64 and 2.3, that one's going to be about 3.7. So there's also an issue that we're seeing between the C5 and uh, the C6. And when there's one level of involvement, odds are there are going to be, you know, others. And then I didn't actually, because I couldn't quite see the, the lower down area right there. But bare minimum, C4, C5, and C5, C6 in this particular person, this is where something along the lines of injections would be considered medically appropriate. So now I'm going to talk just a little bit out of my lane here because I'm not the expert in this in terms of how it's done. But nevertheless, again, I can be a bit more of a, a traffic director here. That when people talk about injections for the neck, there are three general types that we'd be talking about. Number one, we'd be talking about cortisone or uh, some kind of a, a steroid. Number two is going to be prolotherapy and number three is going to be a protein-rich plasma aka PRP. 
injection. So let's hit what the first one is. So a cortisone injection. This is something that a medical doctor or an orthopedist will do when they are simply put trying to provide symptomatic relief. They're trying to figure out what is the exact ligament or nerve or structure in your body that's producing the pain or other symptoms in the first place. So what do you essentially do? You numb it up. And it sometimes is a process of trial and success, but when you can find, yep, yep, that's the one, person's got a lot of pain, they've got headaches, they have an injection, oh, that feels better. Okay, good, we know what the structure is involved that's producing those issues in the first place. Now, what I wanna say about a cortisone is that in and of itself, that doesn't fix what the issue is. It provides relief, but whatever the underlying structural issue is that created it in the first place, that is most likely still there. So for a person, if you've had a cortisone injection at some point, I would strongly encourage you that yes, you could manage that by just having injections every few days, few weeks, few months for the rest of your life, or you can use that as an opportunity to figure out what is producing this in the first place so that the issue does not come back. So that's the, the first thing right then and there. The second one is what's known as prolotherapy. Prolotherapy is essentially a saline injection into different joints. Uh, it can be done in the knees, it can be done in the spine, including the, the facet joints in the, uh, the neck, the ones that are principally involved with moving. And the idea with the saline is that it's a relatively low grade noxious substance. And if you inject something into the body that produces just a little bit of irritation, a little bit of inflammation, it essentially says to the immune system, hey, there's an area that we have been ignoring for a while. We need to heal this up. And this can facilitate that normal healing response. Like I said, when you have a damaged ligament, at best, it can heal up 70%. Well, what if it's capable of getting 70%, but it's only been hovering around 40? So by giving a pro, uh, prolotherapy injection, and again, this is not something a chiropractor does unless they have more advanced medical training. This is a medical doctor, and they give the injection, and what it does is it triggers or essentially stimulates the body's immune response saying, hey, we need to focus here. But as we had also said, when you're dealing with more severe tendon injuries, uh, excuse me, ligament injuries, so the grade twos and the grade threes, this perhaps is where you want to consider a PRP injection, protein-rich plasma. What's done is basically you have your own blood drawn and it's put in a centrifuge to distribute all of the different elements. And then your own blood or your own plasma, it's injected into this site because it offers two virtues. Number one, it's gonna provide that same stimulation, that rush of blood flow, which is going to produce that normal healing response. But what it's also gonna do is it's going to allow for those ligaments to start to tighten. It may be with scar tissue, but we don't mind that in this particular case. Why? The ligament is already moving way, way, way too much. Scar tissue is pretty darn firm, so if it actually allows it to start to tighten back up this way, this is a case where scar tissue is actually going to be a good thing. So prolotherapy, really, really good, but sometimes, depending on the level of the instability, kind of the way that this person's comment was directed, my opinion is that PRP would work a little bit better. Now, I don't want to lie about that, PRP is gonna be more expensive. And something else that I need to, to mention right here, it is that as much as we wish that we could say, well, I'll do this as a bit of a contrast. I mean, one of the critiques that people have uh, with chiropractic is that you have to go back. It's not like a, a one and done adjustment. This is true of anything. It's because unlike your teeth, you know, you have a, a cavity, you fill it up, you're usually good to go. But the joints of your spine, they're designed to move. 
And as a result, because you need to keep that motion there, normal motion, not too little, not too much, those forces of time, gravity, and stress, they have an impact. So it's not a one size fits all. Now that said, if a person is just keep going back to the chiropractor, they feel fine as long as they go for a weekly or even a fortnightly adjustment, mm, something's not quite right there in my opinion. And there's going to be different circumstances. People have different degrees of previous damage, arthritis, stability, instability. But a person is doing good, not great, but good in my opinion at entry level with their alignment and their stability holding for at least one month at a time. I prefer two months, three months, six months, a year, or even longer than that. But again, every person's gonna come in with different levels of injury. But what's my point in this? Is that no matter what form of injection you are getting, it very seldom in and of itself is a one cure procedure, especially if you're dealing with two or grade three level injuries, it may require multiple injections. Not uncommon for a person to need somewhere between four and six treatments spanned out over a year or two. And I'm not going to lie, the procedures are quite very expensive. I mean, you can't exactly put a price on either a person's life or the degree of the suffering that they're experiencing. But we do have to weigh up the economics or what are involved because everybody's going to have different amounts of time, money, energy, and also the expertise of different individuals. So for example, a lot of people, they look into what's called a, a pickle procedure. This is where you're dealing with ligament instability of the upper skull, the C1 and the C2. This area is different. To the best of my knowledge, there's only one clinic, the Centeno Schultz Clinic in Colorado, um, I'm not sure if they're in Boulder or if they're in Colorado Springs, um, but what it stands for is percutaneous implantation of craniocervical ligaments, so pickle. It's where they go through the mouth to actually do these PRP injections to the ligaments in the upper part of the neck. When that works for people, it can save the quality of a person's life tremendously, but it's expensive and it is also going to usually require multiple treatments. So I don't want to give anybody, uh, excuse me first, I don't want to dissuade anybody from doing one form of care because if you need a certain form of medical, uh, surgical, chiropractic care, whatever, you need what you need. But we also have to weigh up the different kinds of options here. So as a general rule, I mean, unless you're dealing with medical emergency, medical instability, you try the conservative options first. The physical therapy, the chiropractor, by doing the diagnostics, finding out what level is safe to adjust, where is probably not going to be such a good idea. I have made this mistake in the past. My sincere apologies to the people there where I have done the very best I could with the knowledge I have at the time. I would happily give the people who I saw 10 years ago the version of myself today and I would much rather be able to give the people I see today the person I will be with the additional knowledge, wisdom, experience 10 years from now. But we have to do the very best that we can with the information we have right now. Blah, blah, blah. There's a time and a place for the different procedures and we have to do the best we can to figure out this is where this form of treatment is appropriate for you. This is where this form of treatment would be appropriate for you. And then doing the best that we can with the resources that we have. And on that, I also want to hit on the possibility of surgery. The good news is that next surgery is not what it was 20, 30 years ago. Again, if you're dealing with extremely severe things, yeah, there still might be an argument for screws and plates and stabilizing rods. But as a general rule, because the technology has come along so far, including the skill of the surgeons, a lot of times to help stabilize the joints of the neck, what they're able to do is it's a keyhole surgery that's done through the front of the neck where they can usually pretty easily move 
all the structures to the side without damaging them. And then it's a tiny plate that's put onto the front of the vertebral body. So if there's that stair stepping effect, what they're wanting to do is they're wanting to stabilize it back like that so that, all right, it's going to be fixed. It's not going to move the way that it originally did, but where the consequence of it moving too much is actually going to be worse. Personally, I've taken care of a lot of people who have had this particular kind of surgery. And no, it means, guess what? I'm not going to be able to adjust that level of the spine. But what I can do is I can work on the adjacent areas above and the areas below to make sure that they are moving the way that they are supposed to. Not too little, but not too much either. And this person then, where they're wanting to do different kinds of physical exercises to help keep everything as strong as possible, they do exceptionally well. So I don't think anybody looks forward to the concept of surgery. But what I do want to say, and again, different kinds of surgical procedures for different kinds of conditions, there's not going to be that one size fits all. But neck surgery, at least the routine kinds that we're talking about here in this video, they're not some of the horror stories that you've heard about in the past. If I ever needed this particular kind of procedure, personally, I would. If it was a little bit more advanced, it involves screws. Okay, I've got a few more questions, but we always have to weigh up that based on our individual circumstances. So the last part of this little video, this kind of hits on the third comment. Is it possible to re-strengthen the neck ligaments with exercises or do you ultimately need injections? Well, as I've already said, is it can vary depending on the degree of the instability. But yes, exercise is essential when it comes to the health of your neck. Not too much, but also not too little. Now, the tricky part is isolating the muscles that you need to because if you were to be going to the gym and doing hard neck presses sideways, things like this, what that does is that ends up exercising the big muscles on the outside when the problem is actually with the core stabilization muscles on the inside. And the issue here is that these muscles are extremely, notoriously difficult to isolate. So what we have to do is not do mega movements with the head. It's more about making sure that we are doing the subtle movements correctly. I've done a few videos on these, but I'll do just a, a very broad brush air overview. Kind of the idea of brushing your teeth. It's how you prevent and protect against cavities. These are the exercises that I personally prescribe because I know that they make the biggest difference compared to anything else that I've seen out there. And I would be delighted to learn more if there is a better way of doing it. So firstly, we emphasize that the normal position of your head is with your ear over the tip of your shoulder. So sitting up, sleeping up, sporting up, standing up, neutral like this. Not looking up at the ceiling and not with your head sticking out, but just neutral like that. This can be done standing with your back against the wall and you simply just retract your chin. So you pull it in like this. In that position, you can then do subtle little movements up and down like this, maybe an inch. Because if you start going beyond that, now you're using the wrong kinds of muscles. So just simply slow and controlled up and down. You can do the same thing side to side like this. 20 repetitions. I usually don't recommend rotation. There's a time and a place for it. So again, it's just a few degrees side to side like this. But I find a lot of people, especially when they're dealing with instability or disequilibrium, that just makes them dizzy. And so that's not going to be worth agitating things. Another exercise, and this is the one that I like the very most, it's literally lying flat on your back on the floor. What that's going to do is that's going to put your spine into the neutral position. Your chin is going to come back automatically, and that's going to allow these muscles to engage just through their normal tonal action. It also stretches things on the back because as a general rule, we're too tight on the back because of all this, looking on our devices, and we're too weak on the front. But if you bring the spine into that neutral position, that allows it to activate that right kind of way, and you lie there for about 10 minutes. My opinion is that that exercise is done every single day. That does wonders for the spine. I will also say, watch this space. This was a physical therapist who kind of hinted at this to me, but I haven't seen any research, and I haven't uh, tested it out myself. 
but I believe that doing certain movements with your tongue, the kind of activities that a myofunctional therapist would prescribe, so sticking the tongue like this, holding on the roof of your mouth, kind of doing a sucking motion like that, I believe that that also will activate, and I think that that may actually target the direct muscles that you need to be working on in the upper part of your neck because those muscles, they share a common innervation and you cannot move your jaw and your tongue without also moving the joints of your upper neck. So even if your head is perfectly still, if you're moving your tongue, it will activate those muscles. And I think that it could be specific. So if somebody in the, the comments knows more about this than I am, please do direct me in the, the right direction. But for the interim, those subtle little movements, nodding up and down, keeping the ear back over the tip of your shoulder and then lying flat on the back on the floor. That's what I would do. I hope that helps. So there we go. A little bit longer video than I had attended to in the very beginning, but as you can see, there's a lot of different layers to this. And I know a lot of times people have a lot of questions. How do we know if we're dealing with not enough motion, too much motion, and then what do I do with that? Who do I see? Do I need the chiropractor? Do I need the physical therapy? Do I need the injections? And then what kind of injections? Do I need surgery? So there's a lot of layers that are involved. And so I hope you've taken the time here so that you at least have a better appreciation that truth is these are the challenges that we deal with when we're trying to help people every single day. There's not a one size fits all solution. It's trying to identify what's actually going on so that you can get the best possible treatment that you can. So thank you guys for watching this video. If you have liked it, please do remember to click that like and subscribe button and share this video with your friends, your family members, clients, colleagues, anybody who you think needs this kind of information so that they can have more knowledge and know what's the avenues available to them that they're able to go down to find the solutions that they're looking for. And if you want some more information about what we can do to help, you can visit us at our clinic website. It's clearchirospokane.com, servicing the greater inland uh, Pacific Northwest uh, areas, uh, Eastern Washington, Northern Idaho, and uh, Southern BC, and uh, also uh, Alberta. So anything that we can do to help out, don't ever hesitate to reach out to us. We'll do the best we can. Thank you guys again for watching. This is Dr. Jeffrey Hanna, Clear Chiropractic Spokane. Get well, live well, stay well. Till next time, take care and bye-bye.